Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us, and welcome to the next in our series of uh, Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness webinars. Uh, today's topic is on using competency models, and in particular, to enhance leadership development. Uh, my name is Rick Lepsinger. I will be your presenter and host for today's session, so welcome, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to talk about four primary uh, topics. We'll talk about why competencies are important, why they matter, why they're useful. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about how to develop them and some of the choices that you'll make about developing them. Uh, and then we'll move to talk about how to leverage them, how to get the most use out of them to be able to enhance your human resource management systems. And I'll end by sharing with you a little story, a case study about one company that use competency models in particular to enhance their hiring, selection, and promotion systems. Today's program is based on um, the research and experience we've had in developing competency models, and the information comes from uh, primarily uh, my book, uh, co-authored with uh, Tony Lucia, The Art and Science of Competency Modeling, pinpointing critical success factors in organizations. And you can find this on uh, Amazon.com. So um, what is a competency model? Just to start there. And basically what the competency model does is to define in very specific terms what are the, comp the capabilities, the skills, the attributes that are needed to perform a particular job, to meet a specific business challenge. And if you take a look at the competency pyramid, you'll be able to see what the components are. Starting at the bottom, we have aptitude and personal characteristics. These are the qualities, if you will, that drive the ability to learn and the ability to apply what you've learned. On top of that are skills skills and knowledge, uh, which again are things that are easier to learn and develop. So the aptitude and personal characteristics tend to be more innate, much more difficult to develop, like mechanical aptitude or financial aptitude, if you will. And then the skills are coming off of that aptitude and your ability to apply them. In the competency model, the skills, knowledge, personal characteristics are all captured in behavioral terms. And it's the behaviors that translate these skills, knowledge, and aptitude into observable components. So just a moment on why they're important. And really, competency models are the foundation for uh, building a strong human resource management system. And they do a number of things. They clarify expectations. They help focus feedback on areas that make the uh, critical difference. They help ensure that your investment in development activities will have the greatest impact. And they also increase the confidence in your succession planning uh, processes to ensure you've got a strong pipeline of future leaders. Let's talk a little bit about the development side and some of the decisions and choices that you make along the way. Just a quick overview. Uh, in terms of approaching the competency model process, there's a number of just decisions to make. One is the purpose of the model. Is this around uh, focused on organizational change, culture change, driving um, a new business strategy? Is it to enhance leader uh, effectiveness and performance? What's the reason why you're doing it? And then to move to the scope of the project and who should be involved? Who's the target audience overall? You also have some choices around uh, approaches to data collection. And again, uh, developing the model can be time consuming uh, if you go into interviews, focus groups, etc. And there are some. Uh, more efficient shortcut ways to use surveys, questionnaires, but it's critical to get some sense of how you go about collecting the data. 
the overarching decision is do you actually need to create a competency model from scratch? Do you need to develop your own unique model or is there an existing model already in the marketplace that would serve you well? And the last decision is around validating the model. And validation is does, it, does your model in fact differentiate top performers? Is it a, a way to predict uh, top performance? Uh, and here the validation would be important depending on how you were planning to use it. If you were using it purely for let's say development to focus on particular areas versus performance management or succession management, you may or may not need to do the validation aspect. And I'll talk a little bit more about that going forward. So the start of developing your model is to identify your performance criteria. What, what does good look like? What do top performers look like? How are they contributing to the organization? And then to identify the individuals in the organization that are meeting that performance criteria, exceeding the criteria, and fall below. Because you're trying to get a feel for, again, what do the top performers do? But more than that, what differentiates them from your standard average performer and for those who are below performance expectations? Then you move into the data collection stage. Uh, best practice is around observing uh, and interviewing job incumbents, people who are already in the in position or at the level that you're focused on. And what you're trying to do is to identify the specific behaviors, the skills, the traits that they seem to have that contribute to their success. And when you compare what the top performers do from the below standard performers, you're able to better differentiate what contributes to the success of your top performers. Out of that data comes an interim model. This is sort of your first pass to trying to capture these key behaviors and the overall competencies. And then that interim model can be uh, reviewed by focus groups or your steering committee giving you feedback from people who are in the position as well. That data would then be analyzed and you would then refine the model. When it comes to validation, the most efficient way to do that is to take your interim model, convert it into a 360 survey. Then take your population, divide them into average and exceptional groups, administer the sur survey and analyze the data looking at what are the groups who have been identified as, ex as exceptional, meaning they're already achieving the performance expectations against those who are, who are average. This then provides you with information to help you streamline the model to get it down to the critical few at, um, or to just overall enhance the, the competency model itself. So it's focusing on the key factors that drive success in the organization. And this is what something like that might look like. So for a competency like communication, you would end up with behaviors that capture when communication is done in a highly effective way, when it's done effectively to standard, and when it's done in a less effective way. Now this is also what makes your competency unique to the organization. So for example, in the work we do, almost every organization we work with has some version of communication uh, as a key competency. But how do you define that in a way that makes it unique for your organization and not just a boilerplate communication in general? And it's the behavior examples that capture what's special or required for your organization. This framework also prepares your competency model to be integrated into your human resource management system. So with these behavior examples on these three overall dimensions, it's ready to be integrated into your selection, hiring systems, your um, uh, training and development systems, your performance management, and your succession planning systems. So we'll talk a bit more about what that looks like, but this is sort of the framework you'd like to have so it's ready 
to move into that stage. And that is the fifth stage, is to integrate it into your HR processes and systems. Without that, the model is just a nice description of what uh, people should be doing. But the model itself really does tie your human resource systems together so that they're well integrated and everybody's talking the same language, everybody's focused on the same things throughout the system. So you're hiring people with the competencies that you're looking for, you're focused on developing the competencies that contribute to success, you're coaching and providing feedback and measuring performance on key competencies, and you're using them as the baseline to identify high potential managers and for your promotion decisions. So let's start with integrating competency models into training and development processes. And here there are a number of benefits. One of them is that it really does focus on relevant behaviors and skills. Out of all the things, and if you may have seen some other competency models, and there are some out there that have literally hundreds of competencies that contribute to leader effectiveness. But what are the things that really make the difference in your organization? So this allows you to really focus on the things that are most relevant and important for your organization and your leaders. It also ensures that your uh, training and development opportunities will be aligned with the values and the strategies of the organization because you've been identifying competencies that contribute to organizational success. It will also make sure that you're getting the most leverage out of your training and development dollars and the time that's invested because you're focusing on the critical few. And it provides a framework for ongoing coaching and feedback, which also links to the overall performance management system. So the first step is to identify where the gaps are. How are people currently doing against these competencies? So you would convert your competency model into a 360 survey, and you take a look at the results on the individual and the organizational level. It also makes sense to take a look at current performance appraisal data. Although there, it may not be perfect, there may be some noise in there, it still adds some value to take a look at what's coming out of those one-on-ones that managers are having. With that data available to you, you're able now to get clear about what are needs on a broader organizational level as you take a look at the aggregate data, and you're also able to identify more specific individual needs. That information is then can be used either at the enterprise level or on the one-on-one -on -one level to identify specific on the job assignments or action learning assignments that would help you close the gaps. And this gets at that 70-20-10 model. It also can focus and drive and target coaching and mentoring conversations. And it helps you identify specifically the training programs that would have the most impact, whether they're face-to-face -face or virtual instructor-led or e-learning courses, you can target the high priority areas rather than just doing sort of random, hey, I think this is important, or having everybody do the exact same thing. And again, this can be done at both the organizational level and at the individual level. The follow-up is also important, and here again, building on what's done before, to use the post-test on 360 to see if there's been any change in behavior, and you could do that at least six months after the original, but you know that could be on an annual basis or every 18 months. The ongoing coaching is another way to check in, and of course your periodic or annual performance review discussions are ways, but now your conversations are more targeted to specific learning and development needs as opposed to more just random discussions about how things are going. Taking a look at your performance review process, integrating competencies into that system adds significant value as well. How do you do that? 
it starts with a general philosophy. And what you're trying to do, and this is where many organizations are already moving, is it's not just important to talk about what people accomplish in terms of performance targets, but it's also important to think about how they accomplish it. And this is where a lot of the culture change is driven. Culture change starts with communicating to people what you want them to do, but it's reinforced in the performance management process where you're focused equally to some extent on how it gets done and what gets done. So for example, you know, there could be a manager who's great at accomplishing their team objectives, but they may not be as collaborative or team oriented as you would like. And in that case, achieving the goal is good, but you don't get full credit if you're not doing it in a collaborative uh, manner. So to uh, achieve this objective and integrate it into your performance management system, you want to make sure first everybody understands the ground rules, what will they be measured on, and sometimes this transition can take a year or more. So the first year you introduce it to let everybody know what the new rules are, and then just everybody's getting comfortable with that. The next year you might say, and now it really matters because you've had a time to kind of get adjusted. But you want to make sure there's a shared understanding of what will be monitored and what will be measured. And again, this also brings continuity and consistency across the organization to make sure you're getting critical mass and focus across the enterprise on the behaviors that appear to make the difference. Then, of course, there's collecting data. Now, again, this is done over the course of the year, but now the manager has more focus for gathering information. So, again, rather than just the random collection of things, they can really target what they're looking for based on this critical list or the specific things based on the conversation with the individual. And now, the third piece is around focusing the performance appraisal discussion. And having this shared picture really does contribute to making these conversations more constructive. And one of the problems that lead managers face in engaging in these performance discussions is that there's a different point of view on what's important or what you're looking for. But now everybody's coming off of this same platform and they know what the expectations are. It can also and does improve the accuracy and perceived fairness of the overall rating because you've been clear from the beginning about what's important and what the focus will be. So there's that shared picture going into the session. Here's what a tool might look like for the performance uh, evaluation uh, discussion. And here, this is at the competency level where you have the specific, you know, acts as a partner uh, with the business units, gain support by influencing, a bit more specific with the rating overall. Or, or and another form of that, you can have the uh, strengths better defined using anchors. And the anchors take the guesswork out of the performance evaluation. And now everybody knows what good looks like, Everybody knows what the development needs looks like. And this is also true for consistency across managers as well. So the manager doesn't have to make it up as they go along. And the manager and the direct report both are clear about what success looks like and what good looks like and what a strength looks like overall. So let's take a look at a case study. And this happens to be with Pep Boys. Um, uh, work that we did in developing a competency model for them. And they had a very specific objective. Um, they wanted to uh, really change the culture of the organization. They had a competency model already, but it was outdated because it really didn't reflect the new direction of the organization, was, which was much more on customer focus and customer service. In the past, they were really looking for technology expertise, and now they're trying to uh, focus more on the customer. So our, our work with them, we started by interviewing the senior leadership team, 
and uh, the next level down to identify both the specific objectives, you know, what does this strategy look like in behavioral terms, what were they trying to achieve, and where they wanted things to be in the future. Because what you're also, in this case, trying to do is identifying a model that doesn't just capture behavior today, but also captures behavior uh, in two, three years going forward. So we did observations and interviewed employees uh, in those targeted positions, and they had five basic, uh, five specific positions. Some were customer facing, some were more uh, in the back shop. Um, so uh, trying to understand what the real skills and traits were that contributed to success. And using this information, uh, along with our library of competencies, we were able to outline that model for each one of the different um, positions. And, and in this particular case, the competencies were very similar, but the behaviors were the things that really differentiated the model. So for a customer facing um, position, communication, let's say, had different behavior examples than for a technician or a mechanic in the back. So the competency was still communication, and the competency might still be customer focused, but the behaviors that captured what was important for that position were quite a bit different. So we introduced the model to the organization so everybody knew what the expectations were, and then we integrated the competencies into the interviewing selection process. And we developed an interview guide, uh, which I'll show you in a moment. And Pep Boys began hiring associates uh, immediately that had a stronger customer service focus and aptitude to learn the technical skills rather than the technician who preferred working with cars. What they were looking for was people who were capable of learning the mechanical side of the job and understood cars, but really had the primary aptitude was on the customer. And that was a 180 from what they were doing before. So uh, in terms of the competency-based process, what it does and what it did for Pep Boys was to provide a complete picture of what the job requires, not just one particular skill area. It also reinforces and drives a more systematic interview process. Um, it increases the likelihood that you're going to hire people who will succeed in the job because you've defined that ahead of time in terms of what success really means. And by, because of that, it makes sure that you are investing in people who, in fact, will be more likely to not just perform the job well, but will be a good cultural fit and stick with the company. And because you have a good picture of what success looks like, it helps you do a better job of identifying derailers and limitations. Because again, it's, there are many things that can contribute to success, but it only takes one or two things to cause you to fail or be a real inhibitor in the job. So in the, in the uh, interview guide, we were able to provide specific questions for each one of the competencies. And here are two examples for you to take a look at, but not just the question. We're now also able to provide what to look for. So now when the manager is asking questions, whether they ask questions that we provide in the guide or whether they ask questions that they've sort of made up themselves from experience, they now have guidelines for specific things to look for. And this also helps them tailor their question to get a sense of, does the person have this characteristic, being a self-starter, comfortable with ambiguity, uh, that type of thing. And this is, what it, this is what the rating scale would look like. So for basic selling skills, which is one of the competencies, they have anchors, which are you know, high to low. This is very similar to the anchors that are provided for a performance management system, because what it does is it defines what competence looks like at various levels, so it takes the guesswork out of the rating, and it ensures continuity and consistency 
across the organization. So the competencies were also used to drive training and development programs. So once again, they were investing in the high priority skills that they knew were predictors of success and that had the greatest gaps. So uh, as a result, and this was within a few months of rolling out the new competency-based selection and development processes, which they did in a test store in Tampa, that their customer satisfaction surveys improved dramatically and their Yelp rating went up by one star. So even in just a few months, they could start to see the results right away. So um, we, have, uh, we have some time for questions. So um, uh, if you like, uh, John, I'll turn it over to you to see if any questions have come in. Please go to the question section and type them in if you would. And John, are there any questions there for us? Yes, Rick, we have a few. Uh, let me just tell everyone that we have re been recording this webinar and it will be available on the website. So please, uh, if you'd like to share it with uh, other people, please go to the website and it will be available in the next day or so. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, the first one is, do you need to develop a competency model for each position and or level in the organization? Right. Yeah, and, and that, that frequently comes up, and that's really one of the first decisions you'll be making as you think about the competency model. Um, in general, what you're really trying to do, uh, we think of it more as job families or levels in the organization. Uh, you know, because, you know, if you have, you know, a... Uh, you know, a training tech one and a training tech two and a training tech three or something like that, you, you might not need a model for every one of those levels. I think the decision is to what extent does the job really change? And that's also true for functional differences. So for instance, if you're doing a leadership or management competency model, to what extent is a manager in R&D different than a manager in marketing? When it comes to the technical competence, the discipline that they are in, there's probably dramatic difference. But when it comes to being a manager or a leader, is it different? And do you have different expectations for an R&D manager or a marketing manager or a manufacturing manager or a quality control manager? And generally speaking, the answer is no. There may be a technical difference but when it comes to uh, integrity, communication, uh, uh, um, uh, collaboration, those kinds of competencies, integrity, those things are usually fairly consistent across the organization. If you were going to develop a different model, the competencies would be the same. You'd capture the differences in the behavior examples. Uh, All right. Any others? Yeah, second question. How can you ensure the model has high levels of buy-in and doesn't just sit on the shelf? Yeah, and that goes to how it's developed overall. So one is you want to make sure that you're uh, including uh, incumbents, uh, people who will be asked to use the model in the development of the model so that they feel that their input is part of the process. Generally speaking, the models that are developed by the senior group and then handed down through the organization don't get the kind of commitment you need to be applied overall. The other thing that you need to do is, I think, make sure that you have uh, a parsimonious model, <laughs> and, uh, which I don't get to use that word very often, but a model that captures the critical few. And let's just say rule of thumb, you know, six to 12 competencies, maybe 12 is a little bit high. When you start to get too many competencies, it just becomes unwieldy and very difficult to manage, and people just lose interest. They just don't know how they're going to do it. Same with the behavior examples, you know, six to eight behavior examples. If you start to have too many behavior examples, the model just becomes too difficult to use effectively in selection, in performance management, uh, in development in any way. So it tends to not get used very much. So it's the uh, how you include and involve people, the feeling that it's relevant and important competencies, and the number of competencies and number of behaviors, so it's more targeted, definitely help increase uh, people's uh, desire and to use it and their commitment to using it. 
when is the validation of the model necessary or recommended? Yeah, if you're using the model primarily, let's say, for to target leadership development, let's just say it's a list of things that good leaders do and you want people to get good at it, that may not need to be validated. But if you're going to use your model as a tool to identify high potential leaders or as a predictor of success uh, in your succession planning process, or even as you're in performance management, you know, to reinforce uh, good behavior and to, you know, critique poor performance, you might want to make sure that the model is actually measuring behaviors that differentiate top performers. So it's, it's useful to validate it, but it may not always be important. It depends on how you're using it. Let's see, we have one more question. Um, when should you invest in creating your own model from scratch versus purchasing an existing model? Yeah, and, and that, you know, that's really the make or buy question. There are hundreds and hundreds of competency models already out in the marketplace. Every 360 survey that you buy is basically a competency model. So there's just a ton of them out there. The, the, the question is, how unique is your situation? Now, every organization believes that their situation is unique. But in fact, are you looking for competencies? that are not already captured in a model that exists. And the other part of that question is, is to what extent is the vendor able and willing to customize the model to meet your needs? So for instance, um, the, 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 let's say a competency of communication. In your organization, you'd like the competence to be communicate with respect and compassion because that really captures what's needed in your organization, right? Uh, you may have a, a competency model might be uh, works effectively across organizational boundaries and you want the competency to be partnering because that captures what's meaningful to your organization. To what extent can you make those adjustments and those changes to the existing model? So if the vendor is able to make some tweaks and customize it, their model might work for you. If you have some unique needs uh, culturally or strategically, it might make sense to do it your own. And the last piece is the overall investment, because uh, is it more cost effective to invest in developing the model yourself and own it, or to continue to purchase and use it, usually either some annual license or some fee that's paid, and you're sort of doing the cost benefit related to making or buying. All righty. Very John, good. is that it? Yeah, that's all the questions we have. All right, everyone, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate you joining us today. Hopefully, we'll see you at uh, next month at our next session. So just stay tuned for a notification about that. Thanks, everyone. See you soon.